what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. So I'm over near Bryant Park on 42nd Street and 6th Avenue. It's a little drizzly out. Um, I got an umbrella here with me, so I'm gonna make do with what I've got and uh, make the best of this. This is gonna be a fun one, guys. I'm gonna perch up in Times Square in a moment. And today I'm gonna be talking about drugs. Lots and lots of drugs. Um, and I'll definitely leave a book list in the description, at least of Crowley books that reference drugs uh, in a magical context, how to use them appropriately and safely or how to stay away from them otherwise. So, as you know, do without will shall be the whole of the law. It's because some people do use drugs and some cultures do use drugs for spiritual purposes to reach an altered state of consciousness. That does not mean it is mandatory, nor does that make it safe. So you must know thyself, be responsible. And yeah, if you find drugs are your master, probably should not be doing them you need to either stay away from them altogether as some people do or I'll talk about my own experience of attempting self mastery in the face of drug quote addiction unquote all right so I'll be with you guys in a second once I find a spot over here in Times Square cheers all right walk magic episode 2 drugs and magical uses all right so I give my own little background with drugs almost as a qualifier. Try not to spend too much time on that. I want to get to how to use them or not use them, why people do use them, um, and what my experience in a magical context is with drugs as well as Crowley. Uh, I've read a lot of his books and that, that subject comes up a lot in his writings. Um, so let's get into it. Now, I grew up in a family that alcohol was very prominent. Uh, my grandparents, my great aunt and uncle uh, all drank excessively, but they all went to work. My uncle was head of uh, security at Rockefeller Center, even though him and my aunt are still drunks today. They're, you know, 75, pushing 80, and they're still drinking quite heavily. Uh, my grandmother gave up alcohol probably 15, 20 years ago. But her and my grandfather were very merry drunks. And then my mother and father, my father was not in my life as a result of cocaine. And I don't believe he did heroin so much, but crack cocaine uh, in the 80s, early 90s when I was born got really big and messed him up pretty good. So, um, yeah, then my mother and stepfather, they were very heavy drinkers and pot smokers. Um, and they abused the hell out of a lot of drugs. So. Needless to say, from an early age, they, drugs and alcohol have been in my life causing problems from the people around me. And yeah, I definitely got a PTSD as a child from seeing stuff that my mother and stepfather were doing under the influence. Just crazy fights, messed up holidays, cops coming, the whole nine, right? Now, when I was 13 and I discovered weed from friends in school, it actually raised my popularity level to new heights and suddenly I was hanging out with the in crowd because I had transferred schools in sixth to seventh grade. So I went to a school that I knew nobody. Um, and by eighth grade, suddenly I went from just average kid to hanging out with the in crowd and we were smoking weed. And I got even more with the in crowd in ninth grade when we turned into an everyday habit. So we're a bunch of kids with summer of uh, eighth grade going to high school and now we're sitting in the backyard basically smoking every day. We got the Times Square cowboy. Here we go. So we're, we're smoking weed and sure as shit, you know, I'm dealing with a lot of emotional stuff at that age already. My sister, who rest in peace, she's passed on at a too early of an age. She was just getting sick with a kidney disorder at two years old when I was 14. So I was staying back and forth with my grandparents and my great aunt and uncle and PTSD, emotional trauma, worrying about my baby sister. Somebody offered us cocaine, a well, pot dealer that we had, and ecstasy, and we started doing both. And it became excessive right off the bat because uh, I discovered not only did weed help with 
emotional trauma. Let me move away. We got music over here. But cocaine and ecstasy made everything happy and numb. You know? So there we are. I'm gonna save the combo here and just get to I've done every drug from you name it, I've probably done it. There's very few that I haven't done, and they're like ayahuasca, things that aren't readily available around here. Now today I'm, I'm clean, and I'm not counting days clean. You know, I, I could have a drink, I could have a glass of wine, I'm not scared of it. And I've gone through a lot of bumping my head in order to get to a point where I'm not afraid of being a slave to a drink or a drug or a cigarette or weed or... I don't really do harder stuff, so I don't have to worry about that because there's no need for it. But I don't get that guttural, sick, afraid feeling of it if I see it on TV or people are talking about it. Um, it is what it is. So I've done them all, from crack to heroin and injecting. And there's been times that it's been good and it's very pleasurable. And even when it's bad, it feels good and things are fine in your mind. But the problem is things are going downhill and you're creating a monster if you're not really on top of it and you're a slave to the drugs. So, uh, you know, I've had my struggles and I can say that I'm not a slave to them today. And if anything, I'm their master. If I choose to do something, it would consciously be a choice that I made. And I would know this is like for this purpose. This is for ritual context as a sacrament. It is not just, I need it because I want to have a good day you know that's not how I it's not how it is today right speaking of sacraments I had to just make a note really quick um, in yogic circles this is recorded in certain um, certain of the tantras I can't quote exactly what book it's, it's I've read a lot of material over the years and I don't always have quotes you know right when I need them to know oh, this is coming from this text in this paragraph etc but um in yogic circles one of the sacraments was considered soma or called soma and what that was is that the guru would ingest some type of hallucinogenic mushroom and would do ritual and consecrate his body and would then urinate and not just the little mushrooms, enough that their urine would be filled with psilocybin and the other chemicals that have uh, euphoric effects or hallucinogenic effects from the mushrooms. There would be enough in his urine that what he would do is split it amongst his students. They would each drink of this urine, it was, and they would call it soma. And so it was consecrated psilocybin hallucinogenic urine coming from their guru. Um, and I just thought it was an interesting fact and little tidbit that I throw in that even back, you know, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, psilocybin has been used in yogic rituals for heightened states of, heightened states of consciousness um, amongst students. So I just wanted to throw that in there. That substances have been being used for such a long time and we could go into Native American shamanic circles um, and how they use uh, DMT derivative drugs like what we call ayahuasca today and I'm sure that there's people who have done a lot of research on shamanic um, drugs you know and how they've used them even um, I forget his name Hamilton uh, he had a show Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia on Vice and he did an episode on salvia, where there are still tribes living in, I believe, Peru and Mexico, that they live close enough to salvia natural fields that this stuff is growing three, four, five feet high, these plants, and they're not smoking it. They're not making the salvia derivative, divinorum, which you smoke, but they would actually make a juice of the leaves, or they would chew on them and they, they'll do rituals, like Hamilton does a ritual where they put um, a, a yoni symbol and a blade in one hand and I, forget, and I guess like a cup or something in the other hand and they invoke the god and goddess upon him as he's chewing salvia leaves and he goes into a trip. So even today, shamanic circles are using drugs 
as part as a sacrament in order to reach a communion with the divine. Now, there was a turning point for me in 2012. So I started weed at 13. That was around like 2004, 2005-ish. And in 2012, I was 20 years old and I was just on the brink of falling back into full-blown heroin addiction. Like I was starting to get the morning withdrawals and not they weren't horrible, but you know, it gets worse quickly. And I ran basically away from my house and I had a friend who moved into Crown Heights and was part of the rave club scene, underground club scene in Brooklyn. And this kid was like, you know, a drug user, homeless, five years older than me. We knew each other from the neighborhood. He knew my family. He hung out with my cousin at school. They were the same age. And we hung out a lot before I had come home from jail. We were like, you know, close to best friends. Uh, this is my friend Martin that passed away. And he was, he had his own apartment. He had everything together. He was hustling, which was not good selling drugs but from where he was and the direction that I was going what he was doing was a lot healthier for his body and so I thought at the time so I ran away from my addiction and fell down the rabbit hole of sorts and hey there's better drugs than heroin and he pulled out ketamine and MDMA and he said I know I know you still need to use the heroin you need to use the dope to for sickness reasons but you're gonna start cutting down and when you need and you feel like you're gonna run, I I'm gonna give you a bump of K. So you're gonna start replacing the heroin with ketamine. Which now where the turning point for me was this. It was a night where we were having a big promoter, I forget her name. She was like a very cute girl with some blonde, dyed blonde hair with blue highlights. She a cute little thing. I'm like 5'9", she was about this tall. <laughs> you know, you came up to my chin. A cute petite little thing with blonde hair, very pretty. And so we had a lot of stuff there. We had uh, the nitrous oxide, the ketamine, we had this really amazing 25i-NVOME, and then we had these purple, I think that they were like kissy lips, purple kissy lips, and with a whole bunch of research chemicals and MDMA mixed into them. And my friend Martin was clean that night. He didn't do anything. I was with him the whole time, he touched nothing. I had done a little bit of ketamine and it was the first time I fell into a table where I fell asleep for a moment and as I was falling asleep I had this like fuzzy blanket on me like a plush fuzzy and I was laying down on a bed and I felt more comfortable in my body than I have ever felt in my whole entire life. Internally, emotionally, physically, I was in peace. I felt peace and then I, I took like a 15-20 minute kitty nap, a little cat nap on K, ketamine the kitty, since it's a cat tranquilizer, the meow, meow, kitty kitty, a kitty nap. And when I woke up, you know, everybody was tripping so I, I, took, some, I took some of the 25i and probably one or two of the purple lips. We had done some ketamine and we had done some nitrous. Now Martin's still clean, still sober, touched nothing the whole entire night, and the 25i kicked in for me. And what was really cool was that there was a red moon that we saw out the window. It was like a full moon, or almost full, and it was red. Now whether that's because there's pollution in the atmosphere, uh, and it gives like a mirror effect that causes it to look yellow, gold, or red sometimes, or whether there's something else going on. I'm not 100% sure, I should probably research that, but it was red. And so me and Martin went up to the roof together and we were looking at this moon, and this was the first time this ever happened. Now I'd done a lot of hallucinogenics, mind you, at this point in my life at 20 years old, but I've never had my visuals connect with somebody else where we were seeing the exact same thing happening, especially when that person was clean and not tripping. Now, I've written this down and I tried self-publishing a book way back, maybe another time or another life. Um, but we're staring at this red moon, we're looking at it, and it suddenly splits into, into two moons. And then we see it and I said, did you see that? He said, yeah, it's split into two. And I said, look, it's going back together. And he said, yep, I see that. 
it kind of got thin, stretched out upwards and downwards, and then started like bouncing, and then kind of came back to what it looked like normally. Then I was looking at it, and it looked like a human heart, but not like not like that heart, like the cartoon heart, like an actual heart with the little artery valves and everything sticking out of it. A human popom, a human heart in red, this red moon. So it's still like a rock, like the moon, but it looked like a heart at the same time with the arteries. We saw that, and in my mind, symbol symbolically, I was thinking that this kind of uh, represented some type of divine love. I got struck with the feeling of love. And the two moons kind of represented a yin and yang in my mind. Something of like positive and negative. But I didn't have the words to, to really describe this symbol, but it flashed in my mind. It was like I got uploaded with this esoteric information, which is really interesting after the fact. Now, we look at each other, we're describing like, holy crap, this looks like a heart. And then we look back up and it, it turned back into the moon. But suddenly I could see like the man on the moon, the face, the eyes and the mouth. But it was feminine and beautiful and attached to it was this huge, huge body in the sky. Like if you see that whole expanse, like it was huge. Like literally like from here to there in the sky, like maybe bigger. And it was going like horizontal, not vertical. Now that body was like silhouetted and it had the milk, like the stars were on its body and it had like clouds that were like making an outline or a silhouette and it was lounging with its head as the moon and its body was the night sky and it was this most beautiful robust curvaceous woman of the night sky and so i see here we are we're down 42nd street i just want to take a couple pictures show everybody a little scenery a little light now i see this woman and i had no conception of this in my life, I was raised Roman Catholic, went to Catholic school. They taught us Greek mythology as like, you know, a brief little history lesson that these savages used to pra practice some pagan religion. How crazy to worship multiple gods, those savages. They're not as sophisticated as us with the one god that created everything. Ha ha ha, they were so dumb. <laughs> crazy Catholics, you know, they're right, everybody else is wrong. And so I didn't have a concept of a goddess as an actual thing. Yet I saw this thing and I knew it was a goddess, but I didn't know who or what she was and I had no idea how to go about looking for where she was, where she came from, what she was. But I knew at that moment I needed to start changing my life and I was not happy. I knew I was transgender so I had to make that change and I was causing serious depression. But I also knew that I needed to get off the drugs. I needed to stop, I needed to clean up. Now, in order to clean up, I needed to get out of that apartment and I needed to get away from these people. Like, I knew, like, they were fighting over drugs, things were getting worse. We were about to lose the apartment because people were giving money for rent and then spending the money without giving it to the guy that we were renting from for the lease. Like, things were just messed up. I had an open felony that I didn't want to go to jail for, which I ended up going to jail for. And so, eventually, a couple of months after that, I had left. Now, one other really cool experience happened under psychedelics and what that was, was we had these people again coming over, it was a party house and I had done, we had all done drugs this night and I was hanging out with my friend Martin and it was another girl talking to him and he, she projected her voice in a way that I could hear her like, she, was, she had her mouth like this smiling with her lips clearly closed and she looked at Martin and I could hear her voice in my mind saying so he's your brother because I was in the closet nobody knew I was transgender I was presenting as male so Martin started nodding his head and also smiling with his lips closed and in my mind I heard his voice yeah he is my brother and then they both looked at me and it was kind of like a child trying to walk for the first time looking at their elder like wait how do you do this you put one foot in front of the other and I projected my voice into their heads and not open my mouth yeah Martin he is my brother uh, I was so freaked out I went into the next room over the next bedroom and my friend uh, I'll leave his name out was there with another friend both roommates and I projected and my friend that was sitting on his bed went without speaking projected his voice mentally telepathically Wow, you're that third eye is really open. And I shout back at him. Yeah, it is, without saying anything. And they heard it. Please forgive the noise. Times Square is a hell of a place to shoot a video. So, 
the next morning everybody is clean i wake people up after i've fallen asleep woke up in the morning like oh my god what happened last night and martin's like what are you talking about and and then i said i said and then no he looked at me and said what you're my brother and i was like oh my god it's real he's like yeah we know how to do that sometimes it happens i don't know how exactly but it happened so I woke up the other roommate and I was like, did you remember what happened last night? He's like, no, what are you talking about? I said, that third eye is really open. And he said, oh yeah, it is. Like you like you projected. I was like, oh my God, this is real. How, how does that work? And they didn't have an explanation, but now I had these two things that I needed to go figure out. What else can the human do that we are not taught to be able to do? Is this some type of evolution that as a species we're gonna move towards? Like if we're more advanced or maybe back in the day when we were less advanced and we didn't really have language, were we able to project voices? Can animals do this? And who was that goddess that I saw? So I now had these questions and I had like, I needed to get clean because I was going downhill fast and I wasn't going to be able to find out any of this information. It, so I thought behind bars. Now I ended up needing my first dolomite behind bars and that's another story I'll talk about another time. But we started meditating in that apartment. Suddenly, like how I knew the yin yang symbol was connected to this two moons and started thinking, wait, this is like negative and positive, but what does that mean? We started to realize things about numbers and numerology. And then we started to have like these spiritual esoteric talks with other people and see what they knew. And we started philosophizing and it, it was crazy because we were not that. We were like these rough hooligan street kids that had our heads up our asses and we're going nowhere with our lives to suddenly like speaking like aristocratic philosophers as if we were on the mountain with Plato and Socrates philosophizing to people and with people and it became like this quest for knowledge for me. So while practicing actual Thelemic magic, hermetic magic, Kabbalistic magic, ritual invocation, Marijuana tends to give me the best visualization skills of gods and being able to speak with deities directly and be able to see them either in my mind's eye or as a physical apparition. Uh, pot tends to be the best one for me. And I believe the Herb Dangerous as well as <clears throat> Liber Aleph, wherever Crowley mentions Hashish, um, he mentions that you do produce these visuals and he cautions that with pot you're not really able to remember It's like you get a stream of thoughts also of like philosophy when you're smoking pot and like these esoteric truths But you have so many thoughts that it's hard to just grasp onto one and really dissect it to any meaningful purpose That's not really my experience so much. I have gotten that where you just have too many thoughts But I've been able to focus it on the most part, but with me and pot it's more like I get these hallucinations intentional hallucinations where like when i started libra starte for me every so often like once every other week i would just take one or two hits off of a bowl of pot and then i'd save it for the next time i was going to use it. i wouldn't even take it out of the bowl if there was still left in there so the first time i was about to invoke um Bastet, i was actually setting up what rituals i would be doing i was researching her i was getting all the information and the preparation work ready now while doing that, I decided, let me smoke just a tiny bit of pot and see what effect that is going to have on me as a control, sort of, to see, like, am I going to be able to do this in a ritual context, or is this not something that I actually want to do during the first start? It was kind of like a rough test, and I was sitting on my couch with my cat, and suddenly I'm, I'm a little bit high, and bam, I caught a visual of Bastet sitting, standing in my living room a few feet in front of me, glowing with this blue, radiant, godly aura. And she was just, oh my God, she was beautiful. Now my cat looks at her and is like, I could see him like turn around and like kind of like bow to her, like, like showing respect, almost like he was going to show his belly kind of, but like, oh my God, like he could feel her and he's like, <gasps> That feeling tells me that you are holy and I love you and like, oh, I worship you. Like he, he was all over his body language. And then he looked at me and then we both looked at him. He looked back at me like, and I could tell, I could see what he was thinking. He's like, you could see her. And like, yeah, I could see her. Yeah, it's cool. And that was my first time ever like seeing Bastet right before I started Libra Astarte, Astarte where I was gonna. <laughs> so I would get these amazing visuals. Um, pot also 
for like reading the book of the law and invoking Nui, chapter one, I would do certain passages and then I would recite the whole book because I had it memorized. I still have it memorized. I might be a little bit gappy. I could use a touch up, but I would do my banishings. I would take a hit of pot. I would begin masturbating in one time, one time, one way or another. For me, there's multiple ways that you could do it. Front door, back door, pre-transition. So I was able to use a different sex organ, um, and I would smoke a little pot, like one hit. That's all you would need beforehand. And as I'm reciting the book of the law, I would get these amazing visuals of the universe, of the milk of the stars, of Nui. Like that worked really well for me. So pot has always been a very good ritual tool, especially when it comes to invoking. I want to turn to Crowley for a moment. Now here was a guy that, it was a different day and age, and he was prescribed uh, heroin. And here's a person that did these drugs and recorded them in a way that he intended for his journals to help people. And I think when we keep a magical diary, many of us don't keep that in mind, that we're not just keeping a magical diary for ourselves. The magical diary is a, a diary of your magic designed to help other people also. Yeah, it's meant to help you, meant to keep your work recorded. But when you do a practice, keep in mind you're creating an experiment for other people also. Your record is there to enlighten others, to show other people how you made your way through the path, how you carved your path through the jungle on your own. And so by reading other people's experiences, hearing people's stories, we can start to get an idea of what we might need to do for our personal paths, right? So Crowley would write these journals knowing that hopefully other people will read it and it will help them in, in one capacity or another. And he was brutally honest in his diaries, you know. The Fountain of Hyacinth is such a great diary. And of course, like, I, I could see some ego in there. He's trying to encourage himself, I think, when he's writing that this is an experiment and he purposely poisoned himself just so he could do this text. No, I personally, I think, like, he needed to tell himself that just to be able to go to sleep at night okay. What it really seemed like was he already got himself hooked and he's thinking, well, since I'm already hooked and my body's pretty much poisoned and I'm withdrawing without the drug for 10 minutes, I'm gonna try to cure myself because this is god awful. So I'll do it in a magical context where there's gonna be other people who are doing magic and get hooked on drugs and they'll see what I tried, what worked and what didn't work for me and maybe that could help them. So that's my take on why, on how he wrote that document. Maybe he really did intentionally get uh, to the point of withdrawals just so he could do that text. I don't think so. I think he was already there personally and it was an ego thing um, that he just told himself that, no, I'm doing this intentionally so that I could get off of it through sex magic. Um, one thing I want to mention with drugs, if you find yourself gripped in drug addiction, what's gotten me out of it was following the sex instincts. If you find a trail of love while you're in the grips of an addiction, you need to follow that. And I don't mean just go looking for a sexual encounter or go looking for love. No, love is could be family, it could be friends. Now, if you're neglecting your body, you don't have love for yourself. If you're neglecting your friends and family, you don't have love for them. You know, you, friends, family, lovers, they take time and they, they take effort and these relationships really do require work in order to function correctly. So when you find love in any sense, whether it's platonic or romantic, nourish it. Now, I do know working with um, ninth degree formula sex magic, and let's just, let's just call it sex magic because I, I don't care really about OTO and so I'm not gonna divulge any of their secrets. But I will talk about sex magic, period. Now, if you're doing sex magic correctly, that's what's gotten me out of drug addiction. Using the elixir of life really did restore my body back to health. And I have photos to prove how far gone I was because of injecting cocaine and how I was able to use sex magic to bring myself back from the brink and recover, ultimately and then take those experiences and learn how not to be a slave to these drugs that if I do one, I don't have to do a million more behind it. I could take just one. That or when it's in front of me, I don't get this fear reaction like, oh my God, get it away from me, I have to run. It's like, no, that's fine. If somebody's doing it there, 
Like I walk around New York, 35th Street tends to be really bad. There's people doing drugs there all the time. If I pass by and see somebody with a needle in their arm, it doesn't give me that fear reaction of like, oh my God, I don't want to see this. It's like, no, it is what it is. It's fine. That has nothing to do with me. I've conquered that fear by bumping my head enough times and learning what works and what doesn't work for me. Right? I've had a process. I'll talk about that another time, perhaps, or maybe just I'll touch on it a little bit. I want to stick with Crowley. Um, I have a book list in the description, and it includes absinthe, um, cocaine, which I have both of them by 100 Monkey Press. Excellent, excellent little editions of those texts. And they speak about um, the pros and cons of both Such as how Crowley calls um, his text absinthe the green goddess. Uh, it, it's like certain drugs, alcohol, you could personify them. Like, if you look at um, how we call alcohol spirits, it kind of does put you in this disembodied state of being that is somewhat spiritual in nature and allows you to communicate with the spiritual realm and spirits much easier. Uh, I think it would probably be a great substance to use if you're doing necromancy as it puts you in the state where you're not fully attached to your body, but you're not completely out of it if you didn't um, black out, you know? And if you are blacked out, it's almost like you're in a, a sleep state while while awake you know it's rather interesting at the, on the same uh, same time when you personify something it's almost like you're using your imagination to create so let's say we take any substance um cocaine for instance when you put that into your body it's like you're possessed by the spirit of that substance it is now working on your brain and making you function in a much different capacity, almost as if it's working through you or something is working through you. So you could kind of consider it a spirit unto its own that you put into your body and is now operating through you. And I, I guess that that goes for any substance. And some of them, like um, Carlos Castaneda called, uh, I, I think, the spirit of mescaline, mescal, or something like that, you know, more mescaline -y forget exactly what he uses but he personifies the spirit of the peyote as this entity that when you partake of the physical substance the spirit that's uh, within it the chemical now is working through you and is allowing you to interact with wherever it's part of the spiritual universe almost like its own aether if you would is and so you're able to participate in existence on its level if that makes sense and then when you personify something, you're using your imagination to create it. And when you create something, at the very least, it's existing on the astral realm, in the Akashic Records, and now it is a thing. When you make a drawing, and if you, let's say you draw something that resembles a humanoid, or a person, or person slash monster. If you take the time to actually give it a backstory, give it a life of its own, and then visualize it as a, an entity on the astral plane, you've created something. And I know people that do this and actually create gods. Um, and they've worked with them, they've actually given sacrifices of one sort or another to them, worshiped them, and have made, brought them into being. So it's pretty, it, it comes back to, on this, on this topic, um, you know, did man create God or did God create man? And it, it's like both, a friend of mine says. Uh, and I find that very interesting because it's true in that capacity. We take these parts of nature, we personify them, and bam, there you go. You have your, your class of angels or your deities or what have you. The pros and cons of both absinthe and cocaine. Um, the Diary of the Drug Fiend is an awesome text, and I actually used that method to get over smoking cigarettes, where I created a sort of chart, and I would see what times of day for the course of two weeks, I would smoke the most, and then i put a little X, or if I smoked half a cigarette, I'd put a slash, like a half X mark, you know? And slowly what I started doing was targeting those X's where they were the most. So I would take away one or two every day after the two weeks, or I'd take away a half. And so I'd start, let's say I started with like 10 cigarettes a day. I would see, oh, after meals, so 4.30, 5 o'clock, I'd have that cigarette or two. So I'd work on not having one at that point, or I'd work on having half a one. And slowly but surely, using the Diary of a Drug Fee method, I was able to get down to like 
one a day, two a day. I've had relapses and then had to read, but I actually used that method from Diary of a Joke Fiend to moderate success. I ended up just getting nicotine gum, and I like the nicotine gum on occasion. Um, I still chew it, I find it uh, good, you know. It gives me the effect, but I'm not worrying about my lungs. Um, or, you know, the nicotine is a carcinogen as it is, but it's not as cancerous as all the other stuff that comes with smoking a cigarette, you know. So, there's that. And uh, yeah, I do chew the gum still. Um, I can't, I can't stop it, if, but there's really no reason to at this point. I enjoy it, you know, it's something that does keep me going. Um, nicotine is an interesting drug, and a little fact, you know, if you look at 777, uh, nicotine is on the path of Lamed. And there's something magical about that that I've noticed, that when you smoke or you ingest nicotine, if you're tired and you ingest nicotine, it'll raise you up a little bit because if you get an adrenaline rush and because of that quick adrenaline, you then get a crash as your veins constrict, right, from the nicotine. So if you're, actually, if you're tired, it'll bring you up. If you find yourself a little bit too energetic, you get that adrenaline rush, but then your veins constrict from the nicotine and it actually crashes you. And so you find yourself balanced afterwards. So I find the path of Lamed and nicotine a very interesting, there is something magical there. You could alter your behavior and your energy levels with nicotine. Uh, and so I do find it being on the path of Lamed very applicable and poignant. Um, you, you could look at a lot of the drugs that way. For instance, uh, opioids in general are the path of Vina because it gives you that tiredness and a heavy feeling, but also a lightness of feeling as if you're above matter in a sort of way. Um, it also gives you these dreamlike states where you can go into very vivid visions if you're using certain types of morphine or um, what's this, the stuff that you smoke. I can't think of what it's called off the top of my head. Uh, opium. Opium that does give you very vivid, vivid visuals as well. If, um, if you go into a meditative state with opium, you get good vision. So it is very applicable to Vina. Cocaine is very mercurial. Um, so it could be either also Jupiterian because it's a very excessive drug. You don't need it, but you always require more of it when you inject, ingest it. Um, but it's mercurial in that it's very quick and it gives you a very business mind, like more, more, sell, make money, very productive in a sense. Um, and it, makes you, it can make you a workaholic also. A lot of people, for instance, on Wall Street that are up dealing with stocks and numbers and adjusting numbers for days at a time, end up doing a lot of coke because it keeps them moving, keeps them going, keeps them going faster, faster, more, produce more, produce more, make more, make more, you know? So if you, and also uh, peyote is also um, the path of code, you know? And I find that, that mercurial aspect very, very interesting because there is something magical about the cactus or mescaline, which I'm more familiar with than peyote itself. Um, mescaline is the same thing as the drug that's commonly gets you high from peyote and it does give you these magical impulses so for me learning about spirituality and magic as a result of doing club drugs was very very cool so learning magic as a result of doing club drugs specifically psychedelics was a very mercurial thing uh, it was very cool now Crowley he wrote a text about uh, peyote and his experiences with it however I believe it was taken by customs uh, and Freighter Shiva wrote a book that I've not yet been able to procure and read called Coristatio, The Magical Cactus Voice. And I am super interested in that book. Um, if you're familiar with it, give me a comment. Let me know what your thoughts are. I'd love to hear a book review about it one day or get my hands on a copy or a PDF. That would be super, super awesome. Um, Crowley in the Confessions writes a lot uh, about New York, his time in New York from the... 1914 or 15 through 1920 before he went to Chefalu again and he wrote right off the bat that the commerce and the fast-paced nature of New York makes this a uh, mercurial um, mecca of sorts you know if Hermes was gonna live anywhere on earth or be the god of a city it would probably be this one right here be New York and Crowley ended up doing a lot of cocaine here uh, probably caught his biggest cocaine addiction from living in New York and my experience growing up here that stuff was everywhere all the time and it comes and goes in waves because of legality reasons um, but yeah so 
I, I just find it interesting that he did a lot of a very mercurial substance in a very mercurial city. Speaking quickly on legality, I think that that's a super interesting topic for debate. And I, I'm with Crowley. In one of his articles, the, um, or actually two of them, The Drug Panic and The Great Drug Delusion, he writes about the opioid um, ban in England and the UK uh, in the early 1900s, where people, doctors were prescribing opium for various things, including asthma like he had. They realized people were getting addicted, so what did they do? They banned it, just like the prohibition on alcohol here. And even today, prohibition on any substance doesn't work. I would love to see methadone clinics replaced with heroin uh, clinics. Now, methadone, I don't find anything wrong with. However, I find heroin, when it's pure, much safer and way less harmful than long-term uh, methadone. And even methadone, it, it's mildly... Uh, the worst it really does is probably slow you, slow down your sex drive and, and lower testosterone a little bit. They say that it weakens your bones, but I think that that's just rumors and there's no scientific data to back that up. I think that there's nothing wrong with methadone really, even long-term usage. However, I find heroin much cleaner if it's pharmaceutical and if it's administered correctly. Now, when you make things illegal, what does it do? It makes people go and make it on their own or get it illegally. And when it's done illegally, there's a lot of black market money involved. So people are getting hurt. People kill each other for profit. People are fighting over turf. People are smuggling it past the borders and mixing it with other stuff and cutting it and then selling it to somebody who cuts it again, who sells it to somebody who cuts it again. And by the fourth or fifth time that it's cut, it's so impure. Then they start putting fentanyl in it. Like today, it's crazy. It's not even opioids half the time it's opioids it's not heroin half the time it's like fentanyl and crushed pills and benzos and a whole bunch of other stuff you know now all of those problems would go right out the window if it was legal and if you could go to a clinic and either your health insurance or you pay out of pocket just covered it and that would be the end of story it would cut all of the criminal aspects of it and a lot of people that are homeless because they can't go to a shelter because they're testing dirty and they don't want to go to a rehab would have a place to live they wouldn't have to worry about half the stuff that they're worrying about plus when people are cutting it with stuff they don't really care about people's health they care about profit so people end up like there's been stories where um meat pulverizer meat tenderizer has gone into it as a cut and it gave people gangrene and they were dead you know their flesh was eaten from the inside out like really toxic, toxic, toxic stuff goes into this, let alone one of the biggest problems, and Crowley also writes about this, um, is the taboo that comes with it. So people, because it's so taboo, don't want to admit that they're taking a substance, and it becomes like, you have to hide it, you have to lie about it, people look down on you, you can't get a job because, oh my god, you're a horrible drug user. If we lived in a society where all of that sh went out the window, it would be a lot safer because people are going to use it regardless but now you create all of these character defects you create these monsters and these liars and manipulators let alone getting the money for something that's not even worth that price and the expenses and the stealing all of these problems would go right out the window and Crowley writes about this next point because the only real argument is yeah what about people's health the people that are going to OD on it People OD because there's fentanyl, they don't know what they're getting, they're getting a whole bunch of chemicals that they thought was heroin, but it's a mix of other pills and fentanyl and other crazy stuff. Or they did a bag that was weak and they're used to doing that dosage and then suddenly they get real heroin and that shit knocks them out because they're used to doing seven bags, so they do five. They can't, well this is no, it's cheap heroin bought on the streets, probably gonna be crappy. And it knocks them out and that's the end of them. All of these problems go right out the window if it's administered legally. Like, what can people understand about that? Like, it, this wouldn't have got any voice if it was still being done in the projects and only the few white people that do it are crazy enough to go do it and deal with the projects and it was kept in inner city. No, as soon as, uh, what is that giant pharmaceutical company um, that had problems up with the, with the Guggenheim? You know, uh, I can't think of their names, but they were selling opioids to people and they just got Seckler, their Seckler family. The Seckler family brought that into rich, upper-class white neighborhoods. God forbid the Mormons catch an opioid addiction. Now we need to do something about it. Our funders and our the funders' children of our politicians are dying. We're getting 
Apparel only trolls because we didn't do anything about this. Now we need to act. It's such racist bullshit. I'm tired of it. You know, suddenly now we're taking this serious because a bunch of white kids in the suburbs got affected by it. For God fucking sakes, and their parents are selling opioids, and it's fine if you're a Mormon and you get a prescription drug. That's not drug addiction. Now prescribed opioids. I just need to do it seven times a day or more. Or I buy pills from my friend who's also prescribed because I'm withdrawing. There's no, it's not drug addiction. No, I'm a Mormon. It's fine. It's like, fuck off with the BS. It's such hypocritical BS. Like, it's so sickening. So what do I think? The only people that are going to die are people that are suicidal. And that's a whole other debate on whether we give people prop, uh, proper access to healthcare and if our psychological systems that are in place for therapy are actually able of doing their jobs, which they are not. I, I feel like so many psychologists are unequipped and most of them are experimenting still. They don't really know how most of the brain operates. They don't know what most of its functions are, what the brain is, if it's like a computer or how it works. And they, people can't grasp how the human brain works and they do these psychological tests uh, you know, and experiments that, yeah, okay, a hundred times you do an experiment that it comes out the same, it indicates something. But there's so many underlying factors that you could never know about the human mind because it surpasses things physical and mental. They're spiritual. You can't study in the way that we're studying things scientifically. Science, you need observation. Spirit, you cannot observe. You need to experience it yourself. It's subjective on such a whole other level than what we consider subjective. That there's So the only people that are going to die from opioids are people that are suicidal or incredibly, incredibly reckless and are not respecting what they're doing at all. So no, save me the sub story. Nobody's going to OD if they're being administered in a facility safely a dose that is measured of heroin. That is not going to happen. Or cocaine, or any um, psychedelic, or anything. No, it's perfectly safe if done in the correct setting, with the correct people, let alone if you have the stuff for if somebody ODs, um, I forget what it's called, they spray it up the nostrils, and it, it curbs the opioid. So no, nobody's going to OD if you made the stuff legal, like a methadone clinic. Like, it'd be fine. You know, uh, if anything, it's just conservative thoughts that, you know, fear monger because they don't know any better and they haven't done studies and they've blocked science from actually learning things for so many years and they've stigmatized science in their own communities. So we're so far behind as a species from where we could be if we actually listen to doctors uh, and if we had doctors that understood spirituality in some capacity, let alone occultism or esotericism. Um, so it's just very sad. Yeah, I don't think people would overdose. So there's no argument there. Like that's not, that's not a valid argument to me. There's people, myself included, that have done so many drugs for so many years that when you do them safely and you know what you're doing, you're probably not going to die. It's only when you get extremely reckless and you don't um, treat the drugs with care that you're at any potential risk. Now, where else could I go with this talk? It's like, you gotta read the text yourself. You gotta go into the Herb Dangerous. You have to go through the Equinox. Um, Libra Aleph has some great passages on how to use, how not to use drugs, and for what purposes. The Diary of the Drug Fiend is genius. It's a genius novel. So far ahead of its time, people at that, like, people couldn't comprehend the genius of that. There was no 12-step programs. There was no recovery systems. There was asylums for people with drug addiction. And Crowley writes also in one of his articles submitted to the English Review, probably on um, the, the drug panic, um, that we only study cases of drug addiction that people go to facilities because they don't know how to stop on their own. They're not counting studies. They're not actually able to study people that stop on their own, that don't need medical intervention, but there's a lot of people that stop using drugs on their own and are not taken into statistical uh, accounts because they didn't check into a hospital. They didn't need that to stop going through a withdrawal. They kicked a cold turkey or by weaning themselves off on their, um, kind of like cool turkey or, you know? And not cold turkey, cool turkey. Uh, just slowly t uh, weaning themselves off or just never had the, addictive addiction gene in the first place and we're just able to stop before it ever got out of control so it's like even statistics of what we consider drug addiction is lopsided and Crowley writes about that that all of the all of the accounts of people that are capable of stopping on their own are not counted in statistics because they don't go to a hospital they're not dealing with doctors they don't have to tell their doctor that they use 
a specific drug, so the doctors don't know. It can never go into charts, therefore it can never go into statistics. So you can't count that. You can't do science even correctly. So that's why science is so lopsided when it comes to drug addiction. And our political system is then swayed by these studies that are missing a half of half of the information. Half of the story is the people who don't need help getting off of the drugs and that either don't have the addiction that they're that people are prone to or just able to stop on their own after a certain point by trial and error. And for me that's a lot of how it's been. It's been, you know, learning what what happens when I stop? Is there emotions that come up and then how to battle them, you know? For instance, nicotine is a good example. Um, irritability, anxiety, depression, those come without nicotine. And so it's a matter of learning how to deal with those factors as they arise and not submit to getting rid of them with, uh, with a substance, you know? So that all comes into play. Um, I don't really know what else I could say on drugs and alcohol in a mystical sense other than it's a sacrament and use them responsibly or not at all if you're afraid that you're going to fall back into an addiction. You really need to know yourself. I've seen a lot of people hurt themselves, kill themselves, avoid their issues because they're using drugs or delude themselves into thinking they're doing magic because they ingested a drug and read a holy book. Like, yeah, you might get good visuals or whatever, but that's not only magic. You need to be a master of yourself. And if something is controlling you, if you can't do your duty as a Thelemite, as a person, uh, if you can't do your will because you need to go, <laughs> like, let's say your will was to go to that store at this time and you needed to go there, but you don't have your drug and you need to go get the drug first. Well, you can't even do your will correctly. So you, therefore you're a slave to something. Something is stopping you from doing your will. So don't find yourself in that position either. You know, drugs need to be respected and, or not used at all. Um, I'm at a crossroads. Should I bring up the book of the law? Worship me with wine and with strange drugs. You know, um, they will not harm you at all. Now, I mean, what is strange drugs? Is that something that you've never done before? Is that any type of drug? Most drugs make things strange. Most drugs are very strange. Um, you could do a whole study a whole entire lecture just on that statement alone. Uh, I'm at like a 40 minute mark. Check the description, you know, you really need to do the study on your own. I'm sharing my experience with this um, and I hope that somewhere along the lines you've gotten something out of it, whether it's just being able to identify perhaps you've had issues with drugs and you've overcome them either using Dilemma. Uh, oh, banishings. I will say banishings are a great way to combat cravings. You get a craving for something, LBRP right away. That will clean the slate so quick. Maybe you need to do it twice or three times over the course of a half hour. But when you're in the early stages of battling the drug addiction or the fiending part, yeah, do it. You know, magic can be a powerful tool to overcome that. Um, I feel like I'm going to start rambling, so I'm going to stop right there. I'm hopping on the train to head home. So. Love is the law, love under will. Check the book list, don't forget to like, subscribe, let me know uh, if there's any topics you want to hear me talk about or you, wanna, you want me to dive into in a future video. I have a bunch of stuff lined up as it is, but I'd be happy to take suggestions. Let me know if there's anything you liked or disliked about this video. I want to make content that you guys like, so peace. A very quick note back on the topic of the diary of a drug fiend. I forgot to mention, Crowley in that text makes a, I don't want to like give away the ending but he makes a big point of a person doing their true will or their will rather does not have the time to go feed a drug addiction so he actually helps one of the characters um, replace using this chart system replace their heroin addiction with their, with their will and it's almost like a HGA moment, but that person was not a practicing magi or ritualist, yet they achieve the knowledge of their will and what they need to be doing right at the moment they, they get past their heroin addiction. Um, so he uses this chart system, as I mentioned before, about smoking that I've used to cut first cut back on um, how many cigarettes I smoke a day. So the person uses that for how many hits of heroin they're using a day in the, t in the novel. And from there, Crowley's sort of feeding him this idea of how they should be working on their will and discovering what their nature is and what their purpose is in this incarnation. And so 
this person does cut back on the heroin and it turns out that their partner discovers her will before him and that kind of gets him aggravated but it forces him to sort of look internal and at that moment he comes to terms with what he needs to be doing in this incarnation so it's a lot of introspection um, that the text recommends and if you're following any system or any particular of the lemic order there should be tools that you're getting out of that system uh, or if you're doing Crowley's work on your own the tools are all laid out in the equinox and other books by him that if you're doing these rituals and practices you're developing your own sort of systematic way of going about walking the tree of life to achieve gnosis you should be learning things about yourself and just in doing that that's very time consuming as it is and then once you figure out who you are what you're doing on this planet and what you're here to be doing you should be putting all of your energy into that so if you're doing your will if you've discovered who you are what your will is and you're doing your will you can use drugs to help you achieve your will if you need to stay up or you need more energy you could use drugs in that capacity but if you're using drugs and you are not doing your will because you're chasing a substance you're doing it completely wrong and you're deluding yourself so the act of doing your true will leaves you no time to get high i just wanted to make a point of bringing that up and definitely read the diary of the drug fiend it's an excellent i'm waiting novel. on the path train i had one last thought um it happened just yesterday i had watched this movie party monster about a month and a half two months ago and if you've never seen party monster the gist of it is um it's about the limelight club in manhattan which I actually just walked past i should have taken a picture of it <laughs> It's around 20th Street and 6th Avenue, which I just walked down. Um, so it's at the limelight in the early 80s, late 80s, early 90s. It's about some club kids, they call themselves. And it's starring Macaulay Culkin and Seth Green, who play these two gay guys, Michael A. Lig and James St. James. And James St. James wrote this as a semi-autobiography and a biography about Michael A. Lig, who became a huge party promoter for the limelight and the tunnel for Peter Gation. And had a crazy drug addiction and then ended up um, killing a drug dealer in his apartment, a roommate slash drug dealer named Angel Rivera, I believe the last name was. Um, that's the whole movie in a nutshell. Now they're showing them doing drugs and it's all fake because it's Macaulay Culkin's actors. But um, in one sense it was triggering, you know, but um, I also related just to the party life, the rave scene and dressing all crazy and going out and all walks of life are accepted and it's all good. Now, just yesterday, I actually spoke with one of the main people that were in Party Monster. Well, he wasn't part of the movie, but he was there in real life. He was a club kid. His name was Ernie Glam, he calls himself. And I actually spoke with him on the phone. I reached out by Twitter a month ago, and he got back to me. And I don't use social media, so um, it took about a, a month almost for me to actually see the message and then call him. Gave me the phone number. But I wanted to ask, there was no mention of anything spiritual from their usage of club drugs. And I wanted to see, I got to ask some questions about Michael A. Lig, and I'm not going to go into any of that. But it was really cool being able to speak to somebody because the movie hit me so hard. Like just the, the way they partied, the degradation from using so much drugs and just ripping people off and not paying rent and losing, and losing friends, losing loved ones. and shitting on people, just treating people like dirt, treating yourself like dirt, and then up in hospitals. I related to so much of that stuff that it was like mind-blowing. You know, I'm, I was so grateful watching that movie that I was able to get out and find the Lima and change my life and not have to deal with the club insanity anymore. I, was, I had the strength to leave, to know, okay, the game's over. But I got to ask him a bunch of questions, which was super cool. Um, he has a channel called the PU, P-E-E, Dash EU and him and Michael Alig before Alig died um, last Christmas, I believe. Uh, rest in peace, you know, respect. Uh, my condolences. Um, they were doing the channel together, so I got to speak to Ernie, and I was hoping that he was gonna have an answer about spirituality. And if so, I was gonna really try to get, even if I had to, to pay him to do it, or maybe he'd do it um, or not, I don't know. But I wanted him to come on the channel if he had some type of spiritual experience with club drugs. And that was one thing he did not have, um, which was unfortunate to hear because for me, going to raves 
and doing LSD had become so much of a religious experience and you know it was almost upsetting but it was so cool and that's kind of pushed me to do this video on drugs um, being able to speak to somebody that was friends with people in that movie and was so close knit in their inner circle you know um, that it made me want to do a video about drugs and bulimic uses of them or misuses of them you know but lo and behold he did not have any of those religious experiences um, so needless to say I'm not gonna try to get him to come on or do an interview with him it's just not gonna be applicable to the topic of my channel which is occultism and I'll say this as a closing thing on any type of drugs they only get you so far and then you need to do the rest of the work anyway which is meditative they could be a, cat a catalyst or they could be a great help at times they might help you meditate they might help give you steadiness or calmness but you need to master your body anyway you need to be doing your asana your breathing and pranayama your dharana control of mind control of body control of breath and control of mind you need to be doing all of those in the first place because if you can't focus you can't sit still there's no way that you're going to be able to do the greater uh, Kabbalistic work such as the HGA or crossing the abyss or any of the other important steps you're not going to be able to master any of that if you can't master your body breath and mind so those are great places to start now when you're doing drugs especially psychedelics it's like you're here normally they bring you all the way to like a state of illumination briefly or something like the enlightenment is the beginning of the path then you're able to walk with the spiritual enlightenment and understanding that oh my god i'm on a spiritual path for life and reincarnation and on and on and on until i get it and i'm illuminated and i never have to reincarnate again because my great work is complete done success final word of the magical diary success but they only last eight hours or ten hours or a week or whatever you're using and then you end up not back at mundane state because you now have some spiritual knowledge but then you have to do them again to get there so I, I equate drugs and spirituality of like using them is like weightlifting you get all bulked up and big quick but when you stop you lose it really fast actually doing the work without them after you've done them before you've done them irrelevant actually doing just the work sober or clean it's like doing calisthenics. You're not going to lose that muscle as quickly, even if you stop. It might be you take a break and, you know, we take breaks and you get rusty. But it's 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 literally like that. The drugs are like getting quick, bumped up muscle fast. You grow and then you stop and you lose it in like a week. Whereas calisthenics and cardio for a long duration of time, you build up this muscle mass that it stays with you. You don't lose it. You know, it could take six months to a year before you lose that calisthenic and cardio muscle mass that you've built up, you know, if you see what I mean. So that's kind of like doing spiritual work versus just using drugs to get the spiritual effect. So while they can be beneficial, they could lead to uh, physical dependence, mental dependence, a whole slew of problems that, believe me, you do not want in your life, you know? Uh, so I wanted to end the video with that thought. Um, Peace. <laughs>